All right, good morning, everybody. I'm gonna give people a few minutes to log in here. And we're so excited to have you joining us this morning for Main Street in the Garden State, ensuring an equitable small business recovery. Um, and we hope as you're joining here today that you'll be following along online as well um, and share your thoughts. Um, so we're excited to have you here. And I'm just going to give everybody a couple minutes to get logged into the webinar first this morning. All right, excellent. Well, let's get started with just a couple really quick reminders here. Um, so yes, you are joining us. This is an event that is co-hosted by the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. Um, and we are really excited to have you. But also, as always with any Federal Reserve event, we do have to give our standard Fed disclaimer, which is that the views expressed here today are ours alone and do not represent the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia or the Federal Reserve System. Um, and so with that, let's get kicked off and started with a little bit of logistics this morning. Um, so the first thing to know um, is that today's conversation is being recorded. Um, so you will, uh, this will be recorded and will be posted at some point in time on the Philadelphia Fed's website. Um, and so that is something we will be sharing at the end of the event. Um, you should also know that we will be taking questions through the Zoom webinar function. Um, and that is something that you can see there below on your screen. Um, so there's a Q&A function right there. Um, it's kind of there at the bottom. That's how we're gonna be taking questions throughout the event. Uh, that being said, we are using a really unique tool today to engage with our audience. So we really wanna hear from you. We understand that we are here and we've been doing some work, um, but we wanna hear what you are up to, how your organization has been helping to support small businesses in recovery. This is a really critical conversation at a really critical time for our economy. Um, and so we're going to encourage you to log on right there. It's www.slido.com. You don't have to have an account. You can log in from your phone. You can log in from the internet at your, at your office. Um, and the hashtag there is Main Street Garden State. And so we're going to encourage you to use that hashtag on social media as well as uh, to, to post in the Slido. Um, so when you log into Slido, I'm going to give you a look at what this looks like today. We're going to ask you a couple questions. Um, and we kind of want to get to know who is in the room and what you're up to. You can also scan that QR code there and that'll get you directly onto Slido. And again, type in Main Street Garden State. Um, so the first thing we wanna know this morning is what is your organization doing to support small businesses? So if you are logging in this morning, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to know what your work is. You may not be in New Jersey. You may be doing things in other states. Um, you may be a small business owner yourself and would love to share what you've been doing and thinking about to support small businesses. You'll also notice that on the left-hand side, there is something that is a poll. I mean, that poll is asking who is here today. And so we wanna hear from you. Let us know who's in the room. Um, so how would you describe your industry? Are you in banking? Are you in government? Are you a community organization or a nonprofit? Are you a small business, a philanthropy or other? Um, and so we encourage you to toggle between those two things. We're gonna be posting things in the ideas section throughout the event. And I'm gonna send you back there a couple of times to remind you um, just so that you could share your ideas and your perspectives. Because again, we really do wanna hear from you. Excellent, excellent. I see we got some government folks here, small business owners, community nonprofit organizations. This is great. Keep answering those Slido questions. Um, and we're gonna go on to just a couple other things uh, that I wanted to remind you about this morning. So first and foremost, um, the work that we're talking about today is really about uh, some work research that we have done as a result of the Small Business Credit Survey. And we're really grateful this morning because we know a lot of people who are on this webinar and are listening in really made this research possible. Um, so if you are one of the organizations who has sent out that survey link, or you are an organization that has been promoting the Small Business Credit Survey, the research we're talking about would not be possible without all of you. And we're especially thankful to our colleagues from the New Jersey Economic Development Authority who have just done an incredible job being partners in this research and this work. We understand fundamentally that we cannot address equity and recovery if we do not understand who is being most impacted. And so while you all see these surveys in your inboxes all the time and you think, what, what good is this? What have I done? I want you all to understand today that the reason this is so important is to make your voice heard. We want to be sure that small businesses are centered in our recovery efforts and that your perspectives, the issues you're, you're facing, the barriers you're up against are really central in how we think about a recovery and how we think about equitable economic development investments. Um, so you'll see a link there in the, in the chat that's for the Small Business Credit Survey. That survey closes next uh, this week, actually, November 19th. Um, so if you haven't taken it yet or you haven't shared it, please do share that survey with the small businesses that you serve. Because again, this research is so critical and so important for us. And with that, I am excited to turn it over to our first speaker. 
Um, I'm going to just give some introduction. We are so excited today to have Tim Sullivan, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the NJEDA. Uh, Tim became the CEO of New Jersey Economic Development Authority in February of 2018. Tim and I share a, a little bit in common. We both have worked at one point in time for the New York City Mayor's Office. He previously served as the Deputy Mayor for Economic Development, which is just an incredible role. He brings such amazing expertise to the work he has done in New Jersey. He also served at the Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development and has been really truly committed to thinking about equity and recovery and the work that they're doing in New Jersey. Um, so I know Tim is going to share more with you about how NJEDA is doing this work. But Tim, on behalf of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia and everyone listening in here today, we're just so excited to welcome you and, and thank you for joining us, Tim. Well, thanks, Ashley, and um, uh, thanks for that very kind introduction. Uh, and it's an, an honor to be uh, to be here with you this morning and, and to be together talking about this really important topic. And thanks to the Philly Fed uh, for partnering with us and for leading the charge on, on not just this initiative, but so many other things that, um, in addition to all the critical uh, economic roles that the, the Federal Reserve System plays, the 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 the, the Philly Fed and, and and your partners and counterparts in New York as well, uh, the engagement with. Uh, the states and the counties and the cities in your territories is incredibly important in the work uh, that you all do uh, that we're happy to partner with from time to time uh, as often as we can um, it is really important. Um, so on behalf of Governor Phil Murphy, um, uh, who who has set a tone, I think, for our administration of uh, doing exactly what the title of this uh, webinar is, ensuring an equitable small business recovery, you know, I think we're, we're Really excited and eager to have this conversation. I know a number of our great partners are going to be on the, the panel uh, part of this discussion in a few minutes. Um, you know, I think we've said from the outset, um, one, first and foremost, COVID was an, a, a public health crisis, but right behind it is an, a, a small business crisis, and particularly a small business crisis that's been felt disproportionately by uh, communities of color and women-owned businesses. And the research that um, you know, Rich and the, and the folks in the Fed will, will take us through in a few minutes is pretty sobering. In, in many ways, it's not all that surprising. I wish that wasn't true, but it, you know, the, the, I think the, the, the reality that, that a pandemic that thrives on density, that required uh, people to stay home, that had small business closures, disproportionately impacted small businesses owned by people of color and women is again, sad, but not surprising. Um, because we know that there are decades, centuries of systemic and structural racism, discrimination, uh, discriminatory lending practices, uh, wealth gaps, employment gaps, wage gaps that you know aggregate themselves into an unacceptable reality of, of um, inequality and, and unfairness. And when you take that backdrop and overlay a really horrible uh, pandemic that has just been devastating for small business in New Jersey and in every state across the country. Um, you know, we've seen devastating impacts uh, on businesses owned by people of color and, and women. And so we have, we had a pre-existing extraordinary moral obligation, an economic obligation, a business obligation to those businesses, but now we have an even stronger one because of what's happened in the last 18, 24 months, whatever it's been. You know, Governor Murphy, I think from through the pandemic and on into now, whatever part of the pandemic we're in now, sort of the hopefully the end of the pandemic or, you know, wherever we are in the, in the life cycle of this thing um, has been really focused on equity from the, from the beginning. And that's, that's true at EDA. That's true at uh, our partners in places like DCA, which is run by our great Lieutenant Governor, Sheila Oliver, New Jersey uh, Redevelopment Authority, who's run by my, my great friend and partner and colleague, Leslie Anderson, you know, and, uh, HMFA, our housing uh, colleagues run by Melanie Walter, um, have all had equity and um, particularly equity for small business in the center of how we've been focusing our efforts. And uh, through the pandemic, you know, the New Jersey has had the most aggressive, uh, or one of the most aggressive uh, small business campaigns, small business support uh, programs in the country. Pales in comparison to what the federal government does and some of the findings from the federal programs, I think are a good reminder to our, our colleagues in the federal government that they've made some progress on how their programs get deployed, but still a hell of a lot of work to do in terms of equity. Um, you know, at the, at, the, at the New Jersey level, I'm really proud of the fact that one, we've been really intentional about trying to allocate capital and reserve capital for uh, uh, Black and Latino communities in particular, women-owned businesses in particular, and we've gotten better over time. We've done four phases of our grant program. Uh, the first phase, we were kind of in the mid-20s for minority-owned business participation. Uh, by phase four, we're in the mid-30s, almost high 30s in percentages. That's, um, you know, 
that's a good start. Uh, we know again that there, where, where there's significant needs, uh, we got to continue to push. And so almost 37%, excuse me, almost 40%, 37 percent of our phase four grants, which is the biggest bucket of capital allocated by Governor Murphy to small business has gone to uh, minority owned businesses, about a third to women owned businesses. You can't add those up and make 70 percent um, uh, minority and women owned business because some of those are overlaps. Two percent to veteran owned businesses as well. So, again, we've worked, we've done one really intentional outreach. We've worked incredibly hard uh, with partners, some of whom are going to be represented on the panel, uh, like the African American Chamber of Commerce, the Statewide Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Veterans Chamber, a number of other groups to get the word out that these programs exist. Because one of the things that you, you think about how do you get better and how do you make more progress? There's really complicated things like tackling and unpacking structural racism and structural discrimination, and we should do that. There's also easy stuff, like just working really hard on outreach and getting the word out. You know, it's shame on us 100% if we've got programs that are great and that work really well, but nobody knows about them or only some people know about them. That's shameful. And so we've worked really hard. We brought on uh, uh, marketing outside marketing firms to help us. Again, worked really closely with, uh, with folks like the various chambers to get the word out. Um, and that's a really important part of the, pro, uh, the of the I think the recipe for as we think about next phase programs. We've uh, been fortunate enough to receive a 100 million dollar allocation from Governor Murphy and the state legislature in the most recent budget to run a bunch of small business programs. About half of which are now up and running; the other half will come in the next couple of months. Again, with a really heavy focus, 40 percent uh, set aside in reservation for. Um, uh, minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses, that that outreach dimension, that meeting people where they are, that's that language access, those questions are really important. But I think one of the other things, and I don't want to steal the thunder of the research that's going to be revealed to you or, or described to you in a couple minutes here, but I think one of the things that's jarring, um, again, not terribly surprising, but sucks, to put it in a highly technical language, is that I think the, the research that, that Rich, who's a great member of our team, Rich Kasman and, and the team at the Fed found is that access to capital and the availability of capital is a necessary but not sufficient condition for solving the problem here. And again, that's not terribly surprising given what we know about the state of American society and, and the structural barriers and, the, and embedded systemic racism that exists in so many dimensions of our lives and our national life and our local life. But it means we've got to tackle the deeper bigger challenges. This is deep. This is this is complicated, which is which is why we in the Murphy administration are, are, are again trying and doing our best to tackle this both tactically via programs and structurally via policies and programs, um, some of which exist, some of which you know haven't even been thought up yet, via things like the wealth gap task force that Governor Murphy talked about and is established on proud and privileged to, to serve on that uh, task force, which is led by a combination of kind of academic and private sector folks, uh, plus folks inside government to tackle the wealth gap. You know, the, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but the, the, the wealth gap between a, an African-American family in New Jersey and a white family in New Jersey is just staggering. It's, you know, it's not percentages, it's multiples. And when you think about the resilience to withstand a shock like a pandemic, you think about the ability to, to support entrepreneurship, to support the starting of a new business, that wealth gap is existentially important. Um, and, and unacceptable. And so thinking about how we can tackle some of those big macro structural things here in New Jersey and in the country and in the region, obviously with the Fed's leadership are really important. So I'm, I'm eager to, to hear and learn today from you know, the folks that are going to be the various panels, the research that's going to be described to you in a couple of minutes. Yes, let's, let's design programs that are better in, and let's do better outreach, let's do more outreach. Let's also think about those deeper structural questions that go beyond merely access to capital. And access to capital is really important. Availability of capital is really important. But there are, I think the, the, the findings here that this is deeper are an important reminder of the work that lies ahead of us and why it's so damn important and why I'm so excited to continue the work and work with great partners and from our team and from our state agency partners in New, in New Jersey, with our federal partners and with great folks like the Federal Reserve. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening to what, what this report has to say. It's um, it's not all good news. We should we should we should be honest and, and um, forthright. When the facts aren't what we deem them to be, we keep working on fixing the we keep working on fixing the problem. We don't hide our heads in the sand and say, "Well, we tried some stuff and it didn't didn't work out the right way." Of course, we didn't fully solve the problems here. Uh, we got to continue to work at it really hard and make it a, a vital priority uh, for all of us in government, in the public sector, uh, excuse me, the private sector, and the lending sector, and the academic sector, because this this is a problem that needs solving it needs real attention so with that ashley i'll give the floor back to you thanks for having me on appreciate a chance to, to to be here and appreciate the partnership of the fed the philly fed um 
and with our team to to bring this report together. Well, thank you, Tim, and and really, we really appreciate your commitment. Um, in New Jersey to really thinking intentionally about what it means to center equity and recovery, right? This work we know is not easy, it's hard, um, it is structural, um, and it is really about not just addressing the need for capital right now, but some of the structural issues that have historically kept communities of color and women-owned businesses from being able to access uh, credit, access capital, um, even be able to, to get the kind of technical assistance and advising that we really learned from our listening sessions are critical to support small businesses in recovery. So. We are so very grateful for your team and for your partnership. Um, and I'm excited today to, to turn it over to some of our researchers to talk about exactly this report that, that Tim was sharing. Um, so I'm happy to welcome here today our, our great partners and research team, Alvaro Sanchez from the Philly Fed and Rich Kasman from New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Um, and I'm hoping you will uh, tune in today to hear what they have to say, but also take a minute and read this report because I do think some of the issues that we're surfacing here today, while, while grim and while challenging really help us think about when we, when we say equity, who we mean, uh, who should we be investing in? Where should we be making sure those investments go? And is it just about getting out money? Um, is, it, uh, is it about connections? Is it about networks? Is it about technical assistance? Um, there's a much more complicated and nuanced picture we learned from this work. So I'm excited to welcome Alvaro, who's going to share with you some of the results of the study that we've been conducting over the last year. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, as, as she had mentioned, I'm Alvaro Sanchez. I'm an analyst at the, uh, on the Economic Growth and Mobility Project here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. Um, and I'll uh, turn it over to Rich to just really quickly introduce himself before we get into the findings. Hi, so I'm Rich Kasman. I'm the Chief Economist and the Director of Policy and Data Analytics at the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. All right, thanks, Rich. So, just trying to, the slides are delayed a little bit, so just one second. Okay, so it wouldn't be a Fed presentation of research <clears throat> without our standard disclaimer, which is the views expressed here are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia or the Federal Reserve System. And so with that, I just want to get into a few of the data sources. Uh, one of them has been mentioned already. Uh, one of them is the 2020 Small Business Credit Survey Microdata. And it is a national sample of firms with fewer than 500 employees, which we consider to be small businesses. Uh, and we have over 850 employer firms represented in our data set from New Jersey. The data were collected from September 9th through October 31st of 2020. So keep that in mind as we get into some of the findings of the data, they'll be just sort of relevant for certain things related to PPP and others. Uh, and then we have some data from roundtable listening sessions that we hosted vir virtually from May 2021 to August 2021. And we invited over 50 small business owners who shared their perspectives, and there'll be some, a few of them are here today. And so there are a few quantitative research questions that guided our analysis. The first being, how did small business revenue and employment change during the pandemic? The second being, were certain firms less likely to get approved for PPP financing and then the subsequent loan forgiveness that was offered with that particular loan? And then how did firms expect the revenue employment and employment to change in the 12 months following the survey end, which is again, October 31st? And so initially what we found is that most New Jersey firms reported revenue decreases in 2020. In particular, 92% of firms in New Jersey who were surveyed said that they experienced a decrease in, in employment, uh, rather revenue, during the pandemic, followed by 5% that reported an increase, and then 4% that reported no change. So it's quite overwhelming the amount of uh, revenue decrease that was found uh, in New Jersey in our sample. And then... Asian, Hispanic, and Black-owned businesses were more likely to report decreases in revenue. Um, and in particular, Asian-owned firms at 96% reported uh, revenue decreases at higher rates relative to other firms. And so before we get into employment, I just want to talk a little bit about how employment changed between January of 2020 and about July of 2021. Um, so firm employment sharply decreased in New Jersey uh, by 29.4% to its lowest point in April, 2020. There was a steady recovery through 2020, the summer of 2020 and through 2021. Uh, and then as of June, 2021, uh, firm, and that was when this report was being written and a lot of the data were being collected uh, for firms in New Jersey, uh, firm employment remained below pre-pandemic levels, about 
3.8 percentage points below pre-pandemic levels. And so that's really important given the fact that in our sample in the Small Business Credit Survey, we found that over half of New Jersey firms overall reported employment decreases during the time of the survey fielding period, specifically 54%, um, followed by 5% of firms that, uh, that reported an increase and then 41% that reported no change at all. Asian and Hispanic owned firms once again reported decreases at relatively higher rates compared to white owned firms uh, and black owned firms. And then micro businesses and firms with five to 19 employees also reported decreases at higher rates. Uh, you know, at, at, uh, for micro businesses, it's 56%. And for firms with five to nine employees, it's 55%. And the, so those are sort of the more striking or more pronounced uh, reported rev, uh, employment decreases that you find in the data. And so we wanted to start getting into the share of New Jersey business owners who apply for non-emergency financing prior to uh, in the prior 12 months of uh, before the survey. And so we found that one third of New Jersey firms overall apply for non-emergency financing. However, there were sort of certain firms that were more inclined to apply to non-emergency financing, particularly among the race and ethnicity of the ownership group. And so over half of Black-owned firms reported applying for such financing, and over one-third of Asian-owned firms said that they applied for such financing as well, which is relatively higher than their white and Hispanic-owned counterparts. And so... There were some stark differences between the kind of lending lenders that firms were will, would seek out non-emergency and emergency financing during the pandemic. And so what we found is that large and small banks were the most popular institutions from which to seek financing, regardless of the race or ethnicity of the firm ownership group, ownership group. And so over half of New Jersey firms overall reported using a large bank, which was, of course, the most common uh, type of lender. But then firms owned by people of color were more likely to report not using financial services altogether. And you can see that on the other end of the graph there. And so we then wanted to see, you know, not just what non-emergency financing were being used, but then also the most commonly uh, sought after form of emergency financing, which is PPP, um, how much individuals were able to derive from that particular pot of money. Uh, and so most New Jersey firms received all of the PPP funding that they applied for, uh, particularly 72% of those in the sample. However, just 44% of Black-owned firms reported receiving all of the PPP financing they sought, which is the clearest disparity there between all uh, ownership groups that you'll, that you'll find on the graph. Um, and then one in five Hispanic-owned firms rece received no PPP financing. Microbusinesses were also less likely, likely to report that they received all of the PPP financing for which they sought at 62%. Uh, relative to other firms. And as you can see, most firms have, you know, an over 70% uh, reception of all of the PPP funding that they applied for. And so then we wanted to get into firms expectations for PPP forgiveness in New Jersey. And so most firms ex did say that they expected to receive full PPP forgiveness. However, Black and Hispanic-owned firms were less likely, likely to expect full forgiveness, and about one in four Black-owned firms were unsure of whether they would receive any forgiveness at all whatsoever. So there was just uncertainty there, which uh, I'm sure likely had an impact on the way that folks were running their businesses. And firms 10 years or older, sorry, 10 years old or younger were also less likely to expect full forgiveness. Um, so that pattern, again, repeats itself for not only the firm race and ethnicity ownership, but then again of the uh, size of the firm, or rather the age of the firm. And so now we want to get into just sort of the expected revenue change that individuals are reported for their businesses. Uh, about 60% of New Jersey firms expected their revenue to decrease in 12 months after the SBCS. However, Asian-owned firms were disproportionately more likely to report expecting a decrease in revenue. And about half of all New Jersey firms expected no change in their employment. And Asian-owned firms were relatively more likely to expect a decrease or no change in employment uh, within, the, within the data. And so I'll just hand it over to my colleague, Rich, and he'll go into the qualitative findings. Uh, thanks, Alvaro. So 
one of the uh, interesting things about the research that we did and um, really adds a lot of quality to the research is that the Federal Reserve wasn't only interested in doing a data analysis, uh, so collecting data through the survey and analyzing just the numbers, but they wanted to do what we call a mixed methods uh, process, which is you have the data, now let's go to the community that was answering the questions in the data and ask them for some of you know some of the why type of questions behind the what that we know. So um, so what we did was we convened roundtables with small businesses throughout New Jersey. We conducted about six of these roundtables. Each of the roundtables had about five to ten small businesses from the community, and we were asking them these types of questions. Um, where did the small business owners seek financing during the crisis and how did they learn about these opportunities? What hesitations or concerns did small business owners have in applying for emergency financing? Why did some qualifying firms not seek financing? And what can we learn from small business owners to inform future opportunities around access to credit and capital? So this is some of the key questions that we asked. And just so it's clear, we didn't just ask these questions and look for answers. These were discussions. And the discussions we transcripted. And then as part of the research method, what we do is we go into the transcripts, we look for some of the major themes that come out and build research around those themes to understand what are the whys behind the what that we saw in the surveys. So um, if you could uh, go to the next slide, Alvaro. You can actually bring the whole slide down. So, so here are the, some of the main findings that we found. And, and I think they kind of, although we have three bullets here, I'll just speak to them. There, there were sort of six major themes that I think came out. One of the themes that seems to resonate a lot is it's there's degrees to being banked. A lot of times researchers talk about, are you banked or unbanked? And there are degrees there meaning that you can be banked, you can have a relationship with the bank, but every relationship is not the same. Um, so there's a two-way street, and this gets to the second theme, there's a two-way street in terms of trust. So a person or business can have a relationship with the bank, but if the person in that relationship doesn't trust what the bank, the bank has the best interests, in the person, in the individual's company, uh, there's a lack of trust there. And there's clearly a need for trust to be built more from the banking side to the individual. And that really mattered a lot, I think, around the pandemic and access to PPP. Um, also, a third uh, theme that mattered a lot was risk perceptions. So one of the things that Alvaro showed was that certain community members felt that um, these were loans, the PPP were loans that needed to be paid back and that lowered uh, for some community members their desire to take the PPP loans. And so language mattered there because in a lot of ways these weren't loans, these were grants uh, as long as you met certain requirements. So the language really matters in terms of risk perception. Um, one thing that we found that was really important was networks and how important networks were was because, you know, because of risk and because of lack of um, strong bank relationships, sometimes, oftentimes, we found that small businesses, especially small minority owned businesses, uh, relied on networks, networks such as uh, business community centers and things where they actually really focused on getting help from those community centers and, you know, from, from, you know, different networks and even informal networks. Just, we heard a story of a bunch of small businesses in the area just coming together and helping each other. Uh, and that kind of help is basically with information, with technology uh, and general support, which also gets to a major theme. You know, some of these businesses lack the technological abilities or, or just the access to computers and Wi-Fi. Some of them relied on phones. So filling out PPP forms and things like that is 
almost impossible if you're relying on a phone. So that was also an important uh, theme. And um, then in terms of the structural barriers, things that we already knew, but we delved a little bit more into, which was um, just the lack of collateral, the lack of documentation. These things aren't, you know, they affected PPP, but, and I also wanna put this in the bigger umbrella that this isn't just about PPP. This is about general uh, relationships with credit markets and the structural uh, types of um, barriers that keep minority owned small businesses from being able to get access. So those were just continuing problems. Those were problems that existed before the pandemic and they continue into now. So, you know, this is the types of answers that we wanted to get through our uh, qualitative research. And uh, so it was very interesting. So, um, Alvaro, so I, I was wondering, you know, I just had a question for you, actually. Um, you know, so based on the research that we did, I was just interested to know, you know, so what were some of the surprising or interesting things that you found in your research that you, you didn't expect uh, before doing the survey? Sure. I think in all the research that I've done with this data set, the, the, the findings that I've found most surprising at the national, state, and even the, the, the MSA level are the disparities in outcomes you see between firms owned by women and firms owned by men. I think the gender disparities are really striking. Um, we didn't really get do in the weeds on that in this presentation, but I mean, that's something you can look in at the data appendix. And then there's another report we're releasing in a few weeks on, on that as well. But those are the particular findings that I have found most striking. And I think uh, very concerning along with what we've presented here today as the top line findings. But, you know, Rich, I have a question for you. What do you think in, in your analysis of the qualitative findings, which, which findings were most surprising or, or interesting to you? Mm. Well, I, I found uh, what was most interesting to me as an economist, and you know, we often talk about the need for information and building of networks uh, to be in generally important in economies. And that really shined through in our qualitative research that we found how important networks were and formal and informal, right? So, um, you know, so business centers, but also just the informal networks that came together uh, to uh, enable uh, small business owners to get access and also share information, but, you know, fill out forms together, things like that, and how important that was. Uh, and obviously the trust that, that exists there um, during this very tough time. So, you know, that, that how much that shined through in the research, those importance of networks. And, you know, that was important to me as somebody who works for the state and the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. It's certainly an area of focus that we take seriously. We do work with, um, with you know, different communities like, you know, the African-American Chamber of Commerce and the Hispanic Chamber to help with that type of outreach. And to me, it just built the need to continue to do that more uh, and not only uh, just access small businesses individually. Uh, so I found that to be surprising and interesting. Um, with that said, uh, you know, what's really great about this event is we have many small businesses here to speak about their experiences, not only in credit access, but in the round table. So I'm gonna hand uh, control over to Ashley now, who is going to be moderating a discussion with our small business participants uh, and our conveners from the round table. So Ashley. Great. Thank you so much, Rich. And I uh, really just appreciate Rich and Alvaro, the, the work that you shared um, and how really critical and important this study has been. Um, I think one of the things that was really important to us as we were putting this together was to make sure that the perspectives of the small business owners were actually being centered in the, the study itself. Uh, we often talk about people without people, right? We look at numbers, we look at the survey data, we try to understand these kind of massive numbers of, of people who were unable to get access to credit, people who were unable to get financing. And a lot of the questions we get asked are, are why. Why is it that 44% of Black-owned small businesses in New Jersey were not able to get the PPP they requested? Why is it that so many Latino-owned firms didn't even apply for financing that they could have accessed? 
Um, so these were the kinds of questions that we took on in these listening sessions. And I'm just so excited to be able to sit today with some of the folks who helped us to host those. Um, so let me just do a quick round of introductions here and I'm gonna bring uh, our panel on the stage. We have some great folks joining us this morning. Where we're really gonna get into, you know, what are some of the problems we discussed, but also the real reason we're here today and the thing I hope you all will join us in is starting to think about solutions. Um, and so that's really what I also wanna encourage you as we are getting into this panel discussion, I'm gonna direct you back to the Slido um, and say, this is one of those times where I'm gonna be talking to my panelists about their ideas and their suggestions, but I'd also really like to hear from you, right? You may be doing work that you have seen that's happening across the country to support equitable recovery for small businesses. We'd love to hear what you're doing there. Um, we'd also love to hear from you about what some supports are that you think that small businesses in New Jersey may need in recovery. And those may or may not be from government, they could be from financial institutions, they could be technical assistance. So I think that's a lot of the things we're, we're gonna cover today in this discussion. Um, so I'm excited to welcome my, my panel today. Uh, I have John Harvin who is here. He's the founder, president and CEO of the African American Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey. Welcome, John. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have Luis who's joining us. He is the board chair of the statewide Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Good morning, Luis. Got Luis there. And then Lillian, who is the regional director of the New Jersey Small Business Development Center at the College of New Jersey. And then we actually have a couple of our small business owners who joined us in our roundtables who are here today as well. So uh, Eric is the CEO of JTP Transportation and Hilda is the co-owner and CEO of SNA Auto Repair. So welcome. Uh, Luis, Lillian, Eric, and Hilda, we're so excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Excited Thank to be here too. So I'm, I'm going to kick off our, our panel discussion this morning by asking you to reflect on this process we went through, right? We, we hosted these sessions, we hosted them in English and in Spanish, um, which is something that is very unusual for us to do and was really, I think, important for us to, to hear the perspectives of all different small business owners. Um, so I'd love to hear, I'll start with John, and Luis, and Lillian. Uh, what brought you to, to this discussion when the Federal Reserve said, you know, hey, we're, we're hosting some roundtables with NJEDA, what motivated you uh, to bring the businesses that you work with to this conversation? What were you thinking about uh, when you came into these conversations? Well, Ashley, thank you for allowing us to participate today. And I want to thank my good friend and partner, uh, Tim Sullivan and the EDA, uh, because those relationships make a, a whole lot of difference for our mission, but, you know, it's just like, um, you know, being stuck on the abandoned on, on an island <laughs> and um, you're, you're out there and you wonder if folks know you exist. That's how it felt to get a response from, uh, from the Federal Reserve and others saying, um, we're concerned about the state of, in this instance, black businesses. Just knowing that folks uh, acknowledge that we have some severe challenges and the willingness to uh, hear the challenges and uh, have a listening ear and, and a connection to the resources and opportunities that could potentially mitigate um, our, our plight is, is encouraging. And it makes us feel a part uh, of the economy. And, and so the, the, you can't say, we can't say en enough about how much we appreciate the acknowledgement and the willingness to, to hear uh, not only the challenges, but some of our uh, recommended solutions. Great, Lily and Luis, what brought you to the table in, in helping us to host some of these roundtable conversations? I just want to start thanking uh, John Harmon for his time. It's really good to have him with us. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure. He knows being around the most influential person of color in New Jersey is, is powerful. Now, you know, access to capital is still our most important need for small business owners. Uh, and we believe that entrepreneurship is the best way that we have to overcome poverty on our communities. And John and I, we, we laugh it to each other very often because we know that this is a problem that we didn't create, that we have been trying to solve for John for a few more years than I. But um, Sometimes we think that we are going uh, forward, and sometimes we believe that is no, we are not getting a solution. And sometimes we get like frustrated, thinking that no, like never we'll be able to to find a solution. But 
The reality is that what happened in the past few years, and especially what happened with the NJEDA, was very uh, important for us because we do believe that they did pay attention, they listen, and they focus on the needs that we express to them about our communities. And uh, Tim Sullivan expressed early today that they make some changes and the phase one didn't get to that many minority businesses, but phase two, three, and four, they did a magnificent job. Personally, I was not expecting that a government agency can deliver and excel during the pandemic and they did a great job. And also we are seeing that the, the SBA is doing a great job with the EIDL and, and the advanced EIDL loans because those are high numbers and they are a providing answer in a short period of time. But the reason because we are here is because we wanna contribute and we wanna keep our agenda forward. And you know, together we are the stronger. And that's the main reason because we are here today. Excellent. Thank you, Luz. We had such a great conversation in your listening session, and I'm excited to have both, both you and John here on this call this morning. Um, and Lillian, we, we got to host a couple different sessions with you and the Small Business Development Center, uh, both in English and in Spanish. And I, I just would love to hear from you about your work and, and what brought you into this, uh, this conversation today. Great. Thank you, Ashley. And thank you to the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia for inviting us. It is a pleasure to be here and, and share this panel with all of you and with great people. And um, what brought you to this was very interesting because the NJSBDC Network is helping our businesses on a daily basis. And when I hear about this, this um, opportunity, why not? It is time to share uh, and express the, the concerns that we, that we were hearing from businesses daily. It's not just exacerbate through the pandemic, but it was um, uh, um, challenges that we're, we were having before, but of course, increase with, with the pandemic. So we wanted to be the voice and represent all the business owners, the small business owners who had these challenges con continuously and um, see if we can make that change and that difference. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and excited today to have a couple of our, our business owners here. So, um, Eric, I'm, I'm going to start with you. And you were reached out to by John and they said, hey, come share with the Federal Reserve Bank and, and New Jersey Economic Development Authority your perspective. What brought you to that room? What, what were you thinking about? What were you motivated by uh, when you joined these conversations? And, and tell us a little bit about your business as well. Hey, hey, my name is Eric Brown and I like rockets and everything fast. You know, my skills in solving global shipping issues above and beyond people's expectations. I'm the owner of uh, JTP Transportation. We're out of Glassboro, New Jersey. It's a trucking logistics company. Our mission simplifies the complex process of moving imported foods and other fresh goods from the terminals, the ocean terminals, to our customers' warehouse as soon as they become available. You know, we began in 1999 with one truck. And I'm business partners with my best friend and wife, Christy Brown. We have 28 trucks now that are all customs bonded. And uh, we, we've recently expanded to North Carolina and Florida as well. Um, I, I uh, just wanted to be a part of this group. Um, 2020 was a rough time, but 2015 was the worst year in, in my personal and business life. So 2020 ended up paling in comparison to... Um, to 2015 and, and what got me out of the, the dark back in 2015 was um, just relationships. I was forced to make relationships with others. Uh, so as a business owner, sometimes, you know, it's, it's human nature to be part of like you, you attract who you are and sometimes you might feel uncomfortable uh, making relationships. There's, there's a thing sure uh, that's, that may be racism involved with banking or, or other systemic racism problems. But I think the other R word is relationships. And uh, whether they be cultural or, or social, you really have to intentionally get out there and make relationships with people like John. So I'm just very thankful to have you, Ashley, and the Federal Reserve Bank and, and John Harmon uh, to, to open up doors, uh, for us and, and not so much to open up doors. I want, as a business owner, I want to do the right thing. Just, uh, sometimes somebody introducing you to a person to speak to and getting a friendly face, uh, in the business world is, is, is priceless, you know, but yeah, thank, thank you. Eric. 
No, and that's actually one of the things we found in the in the, the qualitative study we did, right? It's it's something that's hard to quantify, right? We can ask all the numbers and the surveys and look at data and look at income and revenues, and you cannot quantify so easily your things like relationships and trust that we have found were so, so critical for particularly small businesses that were Black or Hispanic or Asian-owned firms, those who were least likely to hear about the programs through a majority lending institution. Um, and so really, this, these listening sessions were very uh, revealing to us how, how critical relationships are um, for these kinds of economic development um, investments to, to, to be successful. Um, and Hilda, welcome today. I'd love to have you introduce yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about your business and tell us what motivated you to, to join these listening sessions. Hi, Ashley. Thank you for having me here. Uh, well, uh, I am the. My name is Hilda Mera, and I am the co-founder of SNA Auto Repair LLC. It is located in Newark, New Jersey, um, where we actually provide much more than an honest and professional auto services on mechanical, electrical, and diagnostics. We actually committed to empower our community, in particular women, through our educational auto workshops. And many of you. Uh, made me know, must know that why I'm doing this is uh, because the business, this industry is now well seen for many reasons. But the reason I am here is to be the voice of the voiceless. Um, even though I am, uh, even though I am uh, in a process of immigration, I am still undocumented, and I'm here representing them. Uh, we were left out in many, many, many cases. Um, and I, I personally have a, a lot of, a lot of um, um, how to say, uh, personally, I had that problem because uh, when this pandemic came, I applied for the PPP through my bank. And the first thing that I was asked is well, for my green card in order to have it, which, you know, I, I couldn't get it. I have to go to and other organizations that I didn't even know, but I got that finally. And uh, many, many obstacles, many barriers that it came uh, with the pandemic for the undocumented business owners. Many of them didn't even know what is going on and what help is out there. And I really hear, you know, thank Luis de Laos, the Hispanic Champs of Commerce, because it, he was there to help us out. He was, you know, they're sending us a email, sending a reminder, sending this and that to help us out. But you know, I can I can put everybody you know in this in the same basket. I will say I'm the kind of person that I look for help, but many undocumented owners do not look for help because they are afraid, because they don't trust institutions, they don't trust their banks, and uh, and I'm saying this because I have a lot of undocumented customers, uh, and and I speak to them you know, like to seek for help. And they really say, it's, I don't trust them. Like, what do they, I mean, I mean, I, I, they said like, they must have something for me in it, but I know they don't. Or they need something from me in return. So in many obstacles, many barriers, many challenges that we encounter with bank, with, with institutions, with, uh, uh, you know, that they are no hurt to help us. I mean, when we open our businesses, they don't ask us for a green car. But when we need help, they ask us for a green car. So let's fix this problem. That's what we're here for. Absolutely. Thank you, Hilda. And I think another thing that we learned from these listening sessions, again, are, are that, you know, not all of the, the programs that were coming out were able to, to assist all of the businesses. And that businesses like yours are just providing an incredible contribution to the economy and to the region. Um, I know you also train other people to, to do uh, auto repair, which I just think is amazing. And I think about the impact you have on workers and your communities. Um, and really for all of the small business owners listening here today, I think that's something we want you to know as well as we really walk into this conversation, understanding that you are tremendous assets to regional economies. And we're so grateful for partners like uh, New Jersey Economic Development Authority that also deeply believe that and are thinking really critically about how to help and support the, these assets in our regional economy. Um, but Hilda and, and Eric, you both touched on something that's kind of my next question here, which is the role of relationships, networks, and trust. Um, one of the things, again, that, that we learned as we were doing this research is, you know, we can't measure trust. We can't measure whether or not you trust a financial institution. We can't measure not, whether or not you trust a government program. And even if we're putting out the money, we're putting out the assistance, people's ability to get that really depends on networks. 
and on relationships. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering for all of you, and maybe I'll start with Louise and Lillian, if you reflect back to, you know, a year ago, and we're thinking about uh, how you got information out, what did your organization learn about trying to get information out and then the role of networking? And, and John, for you as well, um, you know, how did you learn about getting out uh, that, that assistance that was coming out? Because we really did see it was like a learning curve, right? We learned about PPP, we learned about all these new services, you're changing so quickly. But we do actually think that this is a moment that has taught us some really critical lessons about how to get information to the small businesses who need it the most. Um, and so for, our, for John and Lillian and, and Luis, I'm wondering if you can reflect on what that taught your organizations. And then Eric and Hilda, uh, you know, I'm going to ask you guys to think about where you went for that information and how, uh, how you sought it out and learned about people you could trust, right, and where you could go to get assistance. So you want me to start? Or, or? Of course. Uh, <laughs> Luis, my brother, love you, man. Glad to see you. And uh, I can't emphasize how significant our relationship is with the statewide Hispanic Chamber. When you put the Black community together, the Hispanic community, we make up several millions of people and businesses in the state of New Jersey. But I want to underscore this with Governor Murphy's partnership and the EDA's partnership. It all kind of starts there. You know, we, our chamber, the Hispanic chamber, we serve as advocates. So as we start to get the calls from our members uh, who are really experiencing some, some severe trauma, uh, and not only from a health perspective, but their businesses were closed because of health mandates, if you will. Um, and then, you know, the, the dollars were released from the federal government and then we heard from our members again saying that they were going to their local banks and there was no room at the end, notwithstanding they had an account there. We felt that was just wrong, unjustified, criminal in some regards. So as advocates for our constituency, we immediately went to work to find out, to, to express our concern publicly. And um, the EDA responded in a big way, um, partnering with us and also the New Jersey the, uh, Banking Association. So leveraging those relationships, um, again, it goes back to what I said earlier, Ashley, having a listening ear. If we didn't have the relationships with government and with the banking institutions, I think they would have ignored us because the focus was on, uh, you know, bear in mind, these resources were commission driven for the most part. So the banks were taking the larger clients getting a, a bigger return, you know, up to maybe five points. So um, the, the deal with our, our businesses who had may, may have had smaller requests, that was not a priority. So I'll stop there, but it, it, it all starts with being relevant in society and, and government and the private sector needs partners like the Hispanic Chamber, the African-American chamber, in order to get right down into the heart of the state uh, where, the, where the men and women uh, break, make, break out a store every day. So uh, that just underscores how important we are to, to the overall competitiveness of our state. I agree with John, and I will say that uh, many government agencies, they will pay more attention to us when we bring John with us because he's really tall and big. And but also because he has been developing the relationships for many years. And that's something that we need to understand in our community, that the re building relationship doesn't happen overnight. People that answer our calls today, we have been spending time trying to develop the relationship with them. Also, we was part of the reopening commission, both commissions with John, and we was in different committees. and. But the voice was one voice trying to assist minority and small business owners. And when we got together, we always bring the LGTV chamber, the Punjabi chamber, the uh, veteran chamber with us, because we try to assist other chambers on our own journey, because together we are the stronger. I will say that building relationships has three steps visibility, credibility, and profitability. And people that develop the relationships before the pandemic, they get better outcomes during the pandemic. 
that those that try to develop the relationships just due to the pandemic. And I insist, was many government agencies, I believe Tim Sullivan uh, mentioned all of them, uh, NJRA, um, the DCA, uh, the, um, what else? I mean, the EDA, it was five of, uh, the, the health department is a lot of agencies that reach out to us and ask for help, how to spread the word, not only in English, but also in Spanish. And I think that one thing that happened is that we learned early in the game that we need to use different outlets that we was not necessarily uh, using before the pandemic. And that's how we start using TV more often. We start using uh, all the social media platforms, doing Facebook Live, we're doing uh, Instagram Lives, we're doing using WhatsApp, just trying to communicate with the audience everything that was available for them. And in early in the in the process was difficult because we scheduled an event, a webinar, and before we ended the webinar, something already changed. But because we developed the relationship, we always told people that this is what we know until today. And as I say, is when we are able to together collectively to cross the message to the organization, they usually pay more attention to us and the other thing is, like um, um, John said, we have 80,000 African-American business owners plus 140,000 Latino small business owners. Now, when we go, we represent over 200,000 small business owners that contribute several million billion dollars to the New Jersey economy. That's why they do pay attention to us. And I do believe that they, those organizations that partner with us, they test us. And if we was not able to deliver the request that they asked, probably they won't continue to partner with us because they are data-driven and they do pay attention. If we don't report, or, or if the report from the NJDA doesn't uh, represent the effort that we do in our community, if that percentage of minority, small business owners, African-American and Hispanic, didn't increase from phase one to phase two, they probably won't uh, reach out to us anymore because they are data driven. And that's why we insist to our members that it's important that they uh, mention the, the demographics and the, the location because everything was focused on support minority and small business owners and small business in general, but focus on opportunity zones, very low, low and moderate income neighborhoods. Oh, that makes lots of sense, Lisa. And I'm very impressed by some of your efforts. Uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about, um, you guys did some unique things. I'd, I'd love to follow up with that. You did some unique things uh, at the Statewide Hispanic Chamber to try to get information to people. Um, and that was something that really uh, stood out to me in our listening sessions was that, you know, these are not necessarily the efforts that we would go through in government. Maybe we send out an email blast or, um, can you tell us about uh, some of the unique things you all did to get information out about programs? Yes. I mean, for almost seven years, we was telling um, uh, Univision, which is a, a TV network, very well known in our community, that they don't have a program focused on small businesses. And due to the pandemic, they reach out to us and we have a show every Saturday, half an hour. And that gave us a little bit of leverage because we, Carlos and I, we will talk about some topics we will bring entrepreneurs to tell the journey, but also because that uh, content get hosted on their website, we can use that content to put outside. That way people are able to, to use that content on demand. Because yes, Saturday at 12.30 is not the best time for you to, to pay attention to something, but some people will see it on, on a social media platform at midnight or early in the morning. That helps us a lot. And the other uh, tool that uh, basically we just realized, like, Carlos and I, we are no Instagrammers, right? But we realized that we have an audience that are uh, female between 25 to 35, that they just prefer that outlet. And we focus on that outlet in English and Spanish because they, we need to have the conversation with the members want to have the conversation. It's not where we want to have the conversation. And the last thing that happened was WhatsApp. 
we have several industries that they use WhatsApp as the only method of communication. And we have groups of barbers, beauty salons, uh, restaurants, uh, truck drivers, that they use that platform as their main source of information. And as I say, the way that, that this happened is we was able to attract in enough uh, members. During the pandemic, we opened the doors for everybody. We was no focus just on members, and we even helped people from other states that they was not able to get the information the way that they supposed. But what we what happened was when we helped some members, those members became our social media ambassadors and our cheerleaders, telling everybody, "Hey, the chamber helped us. Listen, I apply. I I already received my deposit. That helped us to attract more people and keep." helping more people as we go. And I think that that was the kind of unique thing that, that we happened. We started a show uh, following uh, John called uh, Chamber Talks. Uh, Carlos started his own show, Que Pasa. I mean, we did uh, apply everything that we know in order for us to be able to communicate all the programs in English and Spanish. We are very grateful because the uh, uh, Hispanic Journalists Association, they really support us a lot. And that was very interesting because, you know, Hispanic, we came from 22 different countries and based on the, the city where you are located, you will consume something from a specific group or from a specific source. And they help us to get the message across all the different groups in the state of New Jersey. So Ashley, let me just uh, follow Luis real quickly in terms of some of the uh, platforms we use as well. Um, we have a very robust e-blast, about 10,000 folks that we leverage, but we too have a television show that airs um, once a month. We also have a radio show that runs uh, every Monday from um, 5 to 6 p.m. That's been very helpful. All the social media platforms that Luis referenced, Instagram, Facebook, we also leverage LinkedIn, um, Twitter. Um, so we're, we're pushing it out there. And then a host of webinars um, that we, we um, convene, um, not only then, but even uh, more so now, in partnership with health providers, in partnerships with banks and financial services institutions. So we're leveraging our entire ecosystem to connect to our folks. And, and, and again, to Carlos's point, this is not, a, not a just about the African-American community, but we come together as a, a cohesive unit to, to bring a little more unity and strength and focus on our underperformance and um, the need to leverage um, our larger resource partners to make a difference. Amazing. Yeah, I, I really just, I, I think it's tremendous what you all have done. And it's also maybe a lesson learned here for some of the financial institutions and government folks listening in. Um, you know, I come to this work from local government. And I think we've been in many places where we had great programs and assets available and people didn't show up and people couldn't get the information. So making the money available is, is one step, right? <laughs> making sure people can get it and making sure people understand what they have to do to get it. And Lillian, this is such a tremendous part of the work you all did at Small Business Development Center. I'm curious if you can share a little bit with us about how you got information out and also the kind of technical assistance work that you were doing, um, which we heard quite a bit about in your listening sessions, especially with people who were kind of hesitant or nervous about like, can I, can I trust this? What is this program? Um, I think we had more people in your listening session that didn't apply at all. Um, and that was really something for us to learn about. What, what were people's hesitations? How did they understand this? What was the risk they saw? Um, and what role did you all have in helping people assess that risk? Right, all right, listening, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> let me get, get a tip. Listening to daily to the, the questions and concerns that people were, were having and to all this chaos of confusion. Um, at the very beginning, what we did it was uh, I could I can uh, I couldn't agree more with Luis and and John about the collaborations and the leverage with all the different networks. Uh, what we did is we we turned our into contacting the SBA and the EDA. They were all available to answer these questions and um, and get the answers to our to our business. Uh, 
businesses who were calling us. We were implementing uh, webinars in Spanish and English as well. And we're changing, information was changing as they mentioned it, like from one day to another. It was crazy times, but we were telling our clients, you know, this information is what we have until today, but tomorrow it may, may change. So stay tuned to we uh, connect with them by email, social media, as Luis was saying, we are using WhatsApp also to connect with our some of the uh, Latino clients and uh, information was there daily. We were having this collaboration uh, entirely to also uh, in our network, network and other agencies who were able to help and provide the answers that our um, business owners were desperately calling and, and get these answers. And um, also, um, we spend a lot of time. It's not just uh, we were working even on weekends, um, extra hours, additional hours, because people were desperate. People were losing everything that they were saving during their entire life. And this were where they, they're um like like another baby in the family, like a like another kid in the family that they were having. So they were losing everything for what they were saving. So we were ready to help them and, and connect with all these different organizations. Um, we learn a lot also because we have to turn and help them into the technology. People were not ready, as Luis were mentioned, were not ready to submit their applications online because they didn't know how to use um, the technology or fill out the form. Um, we were able to help them on a one-to-one -one basis, and Spanish and English. We are uh, also in our center, we are one of the... Um, support from the Mercer County office. We do have entire program in Spanish. Um, everything is done in Spanish and um, we provide all the assistance uh, that they need. Um, uh, we were also like, like Luis would say, we were uh, transmitting live. We were changing also adapting our organization to the new, to the, this changes at, at, um, during the COVID-19. So we were adapting also things that we were not doing before. We were trying to put our right um, if, for, for the business owner. Um, I know we spoke with Luis too. Many times we were we were talking to Luis during this pandemic hours. How can we help them? How, what else we can do? Um, and, and thanks to NJEDA, we, having, we were having uh, information in Spanish available from one day and two days, we had to turn into webinars right there to deliver to deliver to the to our community. So um in this in this way, people were more confident, people were trusting us, and people were also telling other business owners, you know, connect with the SBDC, they're able to help, they're available, they can answer to you, you know, after hours, they can I I I received calls from WhatsApp too. I, I remember at once at midnight, they were worried about their grant with NJEDA. So they were so concerned and they were they were just sending me a message. Are, are you able to talk at this time? You know, I have um and so uh, I applied for this grant. So please help me. I think I I did something wrong and and we connect. The next day we connect with NJEDAs and we were able to help this client right away. So I think collaboration was very important um, for us in order for, for help businesses. Excellent. And so Eric and Hilda, I'm, I'm gonna close this part of the conversation with you all. You know, we, we're talking here about some of these, again, the unmeasurable things, trust, networks, relationships, um, for you as small business owners, and also when you talk to other small business owners, right? It, it strikes me that both of you are, are in a network of other small business owners that are like yourself. Um, where did you go? Who did you trust? And how did you know who to go to to, to get assistance, particularly during this moment of crisis? Oh, I, I was blessed to have uh, be introduced to John, uh, I guess, in the summer of 2020. And his team, we started working through a uh, small business uh, entrepreneur group where we met once a week from the uh, end of the summer through the fall of 2020. And they are just a wealth of knowledge. Um, Miss Mary, Nicole, so many other people on John's team that, uh, man, constantly each week we were being introduced to somebody uh, influential, whether, you know, attorneys, accountants, uh, bankers, and, and uh, you know, it made it, it made it extremely extremely uh, helpful to go direct to somebody that could connect me with the right information. 
So that's who I leaned on a lot. And I noticed the people around me in my network um, through COVID with the PPP loans were very, very skeptical, skeptical. Uh, I'm not saying that word right. Goodness gracious. <laughs> um, they, they were unsure about whether that was a loan or a grant. They thought they looked mm-hmm. at it like a trap, you know, that they were going to be trapped into some, uh, you know, high interest rate loan and, and uh, not a grant. So it was it was difficult for some of those people outside of that weren't a part of the African American Chamber of Commerce that could give us uh, you know some concrete information. They they uh, they 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 passed on a lot of that. You know they yeah. were very difficult. yeah. And Eric, this was something we found really interesting. And Lillian, we heard it a lot from our, our sessions with you all. Um, you know why why did people not apply? Right, we saw it in the data, um, and so we can look at that data. We can try to guess. But actually hearing from small business owners themselves um, about why they didn't apply was really critical also for us in thinking about, you know, what are the, what are those things like you qualify, <laughs> your business should be able to get this, you know, you can, it, it really is something that could be a, a major assistance and yet people weren't, weren't, uh, weren't applying and weren't participating. Um, and, and Lillian and Hilda, I heard you both reflect on this a little bit too. Um, Hilda, I wanna turn it over to you as well and hear where you went, who you trusted, um, and also what you learned from, from other folks who, who couldn't apply to programs and why they didn't apply. Yeah, well, uh, like I mentioned before, I'm a very open-minded, uh, I will say. It. And um, I, re- I remember in 2015 when I was taking a business class, uh, uh, I met uh, Luis de Laos. And uh, he, you know, he was at the program. He went just there to invite us to go to the Spanish Chambers of Commerce. And so... Um, like, you know, I admit it's up to us. Either we go or we don't go. Um, I do remember going with a friend of mine to um, far away from here, from Newark. We took the train to get there. And uh, we were amazed, you know, at least the laws uh, was there, a lot of uh, familiar, how, you know, they call us. Um, so since that day in 2015, uh, I, I still, like, there is a world out there for me. So I made the decision to go every network <laughs> that I could be. But, uh, I, and I do remember Luis saying, okay, you know, I mean, this is to, to build a relationship and do not expect to get uh, a job right away from here. Because that was actually what I, think, uh, I was thinking. I mean, cause I'm, I want to go here because I want a job, right? And then he says, and not everything is, for you, you have to learn to choose where to go, who to go, and you know. So, uh, so before the pandemic, I was actually, you know, going not networking uh, with a lot of folks, not just with the Spanish, uh, Hispanic people, but you know, with other cultures and things like that. So uh, uh, when the pandemic hit, actually, you know, Luis was sending um, Spanish Chambers of Commerce was sending an email. Luis was sending me text you know, to apply here. So I was like, okay, why am I going to be bothering applying if I just apply and they ask me for a green card? I'm like, it's a waste of money. I'm just going to, you know, start, continue working that I'm doing and that's it. And then uh, Luis says, just keep applying. The worst thing that you can receive is a no. So I said, okay, you know, let's do this. So I start applying and applying, you know, and I got a denying some, I got a approving another ones. And um, and then knowing this information, I kind of started like sharing with other people that I knew they are undocumented people and they needed help. So, but the same thing, it was the same response I was I had it. It was like I don't have time for that. I'm not, I'm not gonna get it. You know, I mean, I went to my bank and they say that you know they asked me for a green card and I can apply for this. So why is gonna be the change? So uh, I was like, no, but just do, you know, I just, I did get, you know, $10,000 from this, uh, this thing and, and you might got it or whatever. And like, now I'm not going to do that. I'm chosen sure because they want to be charging me with a, a high interest in, you know, I'm just starting my business or I have only five years in my business. I'm just going to keep working. So uh, what I, you know, I got a conclusion with this is like, as Hispanic people, the way we think, because the way we started our business is with money that we ask or we the safe. Because we know that we, if we go to apply to a bank or organization, even though you have it or you don't have your green card, 
will be denied because they want a collateral or they want to, you know, something so they can, you know, as a backup. We don't have that. I mean, if I have $2,000, $200,000 to start my business, I mean, I'm not going to bother asking you. So when we need you, and I, they have to realize that when we need you is when you have to be there. It's not when we making half a million per year and we don't basically, we don't need you. I mean, come on, your institutions have to understand that we need you at the beginning and the middle and when we grow our businesses, not when we are there and we, you know, we might not need you. So no, this is the things that we have to see. Look, I mean, we know the problems. Here right now, everybody's saying what the issue and what the problem is. Let's for, let's uh, look for a solution. Absolutely, Hilda. And you just transitioned me perfect to my, my next question. And I think you're, you're making a really powerful point here too about um, something that Tim mentioned, right? We, we talk a little bit about this in the paper, um, but some of the issues that the pandemic exposed are not issues that were just happening as a result of the pandemic, right? Uh, Minority-owned small businesses being able to get access to credit and capital is something we have seen historically in our data. They're more likely to use a personal account to finance their, their business. They're less likely to necessarily go for a, a program that might seem risky. Um, and one of the things we really see that was exposed here are some of these real structural inequalities, like the wealth gap, right? Whether or not you have $200,000 and collateral to pull from has a lot to do with whether or not you have money in a house to pull down from. So there's some structural issues here that, that we just can't, we can't just say we can fix by just getting assistance out right now. We need to really talk about some of those, those larger issues. Um, and I really want to pivot our, our conversation now into thinking about solutions. And John, I see, I see you've got something to say about this. So we had some great conversations um, in your roundtable about these. You know, when we start thinking about, all right, we are, we are recovering, we're reopening, but the business isn't getting back to usual for a lot of uh, communities of color. And this is something that is really critical in terms of our workforce, our labor market, our recovery. What do you start to think about when we, when we start to think about solutions here and, and how do we address some of those structural issues? Well, you know, I, I, again, it goes back to the significance of our relationship with, with Governor Murphy, his administration, and Tim Sullivan and others, because they acknowledge that this is a systemic situation and so just as we acknowledge it is a systemic um, situation and um, the underperformance is severe, I think the number um, Tim was looking for in terms of net worth for blacks is $5,900, for whites is 315,000 in New Jersey in terms of a net worth. Blacks still have the highest poverty in the state. And so everything, uh, that has to be done, has to be intentional, has to be focused, has to be deliberate, has to, in some case, um, policy is one thing, but will is another. And I think we use a lot of excuses, particularly from a public sector perspective, saying that we have to do disparity studies, we have to do this and that. People are hurting today, right? And people have endured uh, long enough and so the numbers is well documented. We're in bad shape. So um, what, what are some of the solutions when I say intentional? The technical assistance resources have to be, you know, expanded. And so we got to go beyond just the uh, traditional assessing of a business, a business plan. We have to really get into the sausage and, and understanding businesses, their relationships, their supply chain. Um, um, is it debt or equity? Do they need to get to a better, better place? Uh, um, grants, um, yes. Grants with debt and equity. I think we have to have to throw all our resources at at these problems to get us in a better place. Shotgun marriages. <laughs> what I mean by that? So if the state is extending prime contracts, they have to align second and third tier businesses. We have to be a part of every. Uh, sector of the state's economy. You're, you're talking about wind, solar, you're talking about construction, you're talking about professional services in terms of managing um, um, state dollars, um, engineering, architects, lawyers, insurance. Every dollar that's spent in the state of New Jersey 
has to have participation from the folks that are on this conversation. And we can't wait until a law is passed. We can't wait. We have to be uh, at the table. If we're not there physically at the table, then Tim, Governor Murphy, agency commissioners must bring us to the table to, to get in a better place. Uh, how we arrived here, uh, that's a long discussion, but we know there were some intentions, intentional acts that put Black, Hispanics, and other brown people in the state that they're, they're, they're in. So it's going to take some <laughs> intentional acts with focus and intensity to reverse it. And that's what we're, we're asking for today. And I think the great part, as we look at this today, and I'll close with this, is that you have willing partners like Luis and others who are willing to own our obligation. And we're willing to be accountable for the introduction of our members and to ensure that those members are credible, those members represent that, and they're serious business people. So I think those components uh, make it all work, but everyone has to be committed to uh, mutual success in equity and equality. Very well said, John. And um, for other folks, uh, Louise, Lily, and Eric, uh, Hilda, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for anyone to chime in here. You know, again, we've, we've got folks listening in today from uh, you know, economic development organizations, from financial organizations. When we start to talk about these, these structural problems and we look ahead, what does it mean to, to pivot into solutions? What does it mean to actually see an equitable recovery for our small businesses in the state of New Jersey? Ashley, I want to say that one of the problems is we have like four major problems, access to capital, access to new markets, access to networks, and the digital gap. The digital gap was probably the biggest issue that we have because our members use the cell phone to access the internet. And you can surf the internet, but it's very difficult for you to, to process an application on your cell phone, especially if you need to add income taxes, bank statements, you know, documents that are required to process the application. Now, I will say that the same way that we are talking about networks, we develop our own networks in a sense that when John's get invited to a, a meeting or a, a discussion, he always asks, hey, did you invite the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce? And we do the same. And if one of us get ahead of the game, we will open the door for the rest of chambers that we believe that they are doing the, the work because we want our reputation to be intact. I don't have a problem to commit to a project with John because we know that we will deliver what we promise. Otherwise, we will say we cannot commit to this project. And that's really important because as, as Ilda mentioned earlier today, you remember is visibility, credibility, and profitability. And, and we have been in, in credibility for the past several years. And as a non-for-profit, we don't wanna make money, but we wanna be able to uh, get more funds in order for us to support other programs and in order for us to support other business owners. I insist. Sorry. Uh, yeah. we face a problem when they apply and we face a pro problem when they get approved because many people receive the DocuSign email and they was willing not to sign because they thought that what was a scam. And they say, no, there's the NJEDA already approved you. You just need to sign those documents. And in some cases, we need to visit the customer in person and assist them to, to sign the documents because they was not familiar with that. That was the real challenge. But I, I do believe that the, the network and the um, support system that we develop between different organizations, I mean, if John has a program that will benefit our community, we will share that program because we want people to get, to get advantage of that program because they put a time and energy and a lot of resources to make that happen, right? And the same thing with Lillian and with other non-for-profit and CDFIs in the state is we want our members to do well. We want our business owners to do well. We are over a million small business owners in the state of New Jersey, and we wish 
that everybody can get a piece of the action in order for them to move forward on the economy. And that's what we have been doing this for, for a long time. Absolutely, absolutely. Lillian, I see you had something to comment there. Yes, and I will say that I, I, I agree with John that they label their policies and maybe, uh, you know, they need to be changed, um, you know, to accommodate or, or to, after evaluating all these problems that were, were um, the small business owners are having, not just only through the pandemic, it's just came, it's coming long time ago uh, to before the pandemic. As I say, increased through the pandemic, but uh, these problems are continuous continually is going not only for the Latino community, also for the Black uh, American community, the lower network, the lack of collateral, uh, the little no credit history, something that the, um, the access to capital, those are problems that are coming before the pandemic. It's just exacerbated through the pand pandemic. I think we should make there to make special policies to address these problems that we're having. And um, also I would like to mention that in the NJSBDC, we also create the capital team, which is helping um, all the business owners, first of all, to understand and address the challenges that we're having to access to capital, not only in English, it's also in Spanish. So they have this one-to-one -one counseling session with them so they can help them to get the credit and the loan that uh, that they need. So we have to, I think we, we have to make these changes now. I think this is a time, this is a moment through all the collaborations that we're having with all the different organizations. And we understood throughout this pandemic how collaboration and leverage was, was uh, very important. And not only, um, only for small businesses who were gathering together to get the information that they need to, to learn how to apply for a PPP, how to apply for an NJDA grant. And so they were relying on those informal networks, formal networks as an NJ, um, Spanish Chamber of Commerce, the NJSBDC, the African American Chamber of Commerce. So we all learned through all this um, uh, pandemic situation and collaboration, I think was the best, um, uh, the, the best um, learning, uh, learning experience for us. And also I think it is this time to make the change. Uh, it is the moment now. Yeah. And we hope that this is a crisis that has revealed some of these structural faults uh, that really causes us, us to realize, you know, this is also a huge loss for us as an economy, as a state, as a region, um, if we are not thinking about how to support these small businesses, not just now, uh, but continuing to move forward. And, and Eric and Hilda, I'd love your reflection before we turn it over to audience questions. You know, when we start talking about solutions, what does that mean for you as small business owners? What do you think are some of the things we need to do to really begin to address these structural issues going forward and support uh, businesses like yours that are tremendous assets to, to the regional economy? Um, well, what I will say is like just Lillian said, change the policies, all right? And let's evaluate, I'm sorry, evaluate case by case. Not everybody is equal. So let's give it an opportunity to whoever wants to grow. I am the one, you know, I wanted to grow, but to grow, I need your help. I need capital. In order to have capital, you know, I need documentation. I don't have it. What do you want me to tell you? I don't have it. But I'm here eight years in business. I'm employing people. I'm, a, I'm you know, growing my business. I'm living in a legacy for my kids who were born in the United States. I'm here 20 years. Yeah, you might wonder why I don't have my green car. Well, there's many, many, many facts here. And the other thing is like, um, I do remember they, you know, I was taking a class in Hispanic Champs of Commerce and they took somebody over there to, to share about the certifications. So I said, okay, so I can become a women on certification, uh, a, get a certification as a women on. And uh, they said, but you do the work. No, I don't do the work. I'm not a mechanic, but I'm the face of the business. I have 51% of the business. I mean, if I am not there, the business is not gonna work. I, am the, I do all everything that is operation, operational. Yeah, my husband, my husband be, uh, fixed the cars. I have another two mechanics who help him, but I'm in front of the business. So let's change these policies. No, you, you, you cannot have a certification because you're not a legal resident or you're not a citizen. Come on, let's do buy one, buy, buy one, uh, case by case. Let's not put everything, everybody in one bucket because we, there are people here who wants to grow their businesses. 
I'm not going to get alone and go back to my country. In my country, there's nothing over there to offer me for my kids and for me. So let's work on this. This is it will be the solutions. Let's change the policies. We as individuals, I go to networks. I go to here, there. I knock doors. And like, and, and like Louis says, yeah, many of them will open. But other ones, it will open. And I will keep knocking doors. Because I knew there is an opportunity for me over there. And I'm going to keep fighting, not just because of me, but because of the people that are behind me. It's not just about me or my family. It's about a lot of document business owners that are out there doing business under the table because they have another opportunity. And that's not a win-win. It's a loss for the economy. It's a loss for them. They don't, they don't report taxes. What do you think they don't report taxes? I collect taxes and I report them. But many of them don't do it. They don't care. Why they should care about this if you don't care about them? So let's, for the, let's look for the solution because we all know here what the problems are, what the issues are. But now let's, let's look for the solutions and do case by case because we are people like me that want to grow and want to grow because we wanted to leave a legacy for our kids, for our community. We wanted to be a model for our community, for the women out there that are trying to work day by day. Like Louis says, entrepreneurship is the way to, 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 to not to be poor anymore, let's say that's it, like this. To overcome poverty. Exactly. <laughs> so come on. You need and me. Actually, I'm here. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of nothing. I, I sent an email to Ashley and I said, listen, Ashley, I'm not afraid to say that I'm undocumented. I'm not afraid of it. Nothing. What should I be? I'm not doing anything wrong to nobody. I'm just being an asset to this country. Absolutely. Reason, I and my country. I want to say. Go ahead. No, I just want to say that the best thing that happened was that when the NJEDA include the word micro businesses in the phase two, three, and four, that make a difference for our communities. Because remember, 92% of the businesses in the US are micro businesses. That means that they have less than five employees, including the business owner. And that make an impact on the communities, especially low, very low and moderate income neighborhoods because they was considered on a separate like program, but they was competing with less people for the same amount of money. And that make a difference. They also did that for restaurants. They did it for restaurants on their 10 full-time employees, on over 10 full-time employees, and they did it for daycare. I do believe that the NJEDA, and, and I don't work for them, I don't get paid for them, but I, I will say that, I'm not afraid to recognize when an organization or a government agent did something good. Usually they do a little over 500 loans a year. During the pandemic, they did over 70,000 applications. That's a lesson because they use technology in order for them to scale in, terms, in, in times of a, of a pandemic. That's something that we need to recognize because that's a lesson that CDFIs can learn Non-for-profits can learn. There's a lot of organizations that can learn that because we have been through many things. Sandy, uh, Ida, uh, Irene, many natural disasters and many problems. And, you know, we just happened to be around when, when the pandemic hit. But that way to use technology to scale in order for serve more, uh, in this case, business owners, is very remarkable, and I will say that is the way that we need to do in order for us to serve better our communities. Well said, Luis and Hilda, and I think a lesson here, you know, we have folks listening in today who are from CDFIs, from community organizations. We also have folks listening in today who, who may not be from New Jersey, and they're in other states that haven't been so intentional about micro lending and haven't thought about their economic development portfolio in such an intentional way. And so I'm hoping that the lessons you're sharing here can also, uh, to your point, Hilda, support uh, undocumented business owners in other places, support states and other authorities that are trying to figure out how, how do we do this work? Um, and we do have a question specifically about CDFIs in the chat that I, that I wanna bring up, but, but Eric, I wanted to give you a chance to, to reflect also on, on how you're thinking about solutions for businesses like yours. Uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, 
through relationships again, you know, um, t- it seems like uh, John and Lewis have the ear of, of folks at the NG EDA, like Tim and Richard. Um, it, they they're able to amplify and communicate our problems to to Governor Murphy and to others in, in position. We, we just have a long history in this country of, uh, you know, the problem starts when I walk in a room and, and before the PPP was uh, just trying to go in and get a regular business loan. Uh, once once I walk into the room and they see my face or anybody of color, um, I don't know. It, it's I think we're held we were held to a little bit more scrutiny. So as as through a history of having a business twenty years before the uh, disaster hit of you know uh, w- when we needed the PPP. I think a lot of people were just skeptical, you know, at at one point I I applied it. I was 10 years into my business. My financials were great. Uh, I would sit down and, and my, my uh, profit margins were trending above industry averages, uh, CPA reports. And, you know, I would try to get a loan and, and they wouldn't give me anything. You know, they're very interested in hearing my story when I would go to banks. Uh, But after a while, I just said, heck, I'm going to try this. I hired a very sharp looking um, white lady and I sent her into the bank. And uh, after I had tried a 20 unsuccessfully, she in 2011, she got uh, 150,000 unsecured right on her first meeting, you know, for the company with the same financials and same everything. So it it, uh, when PPP came along, I think everybody was just like, you know, a lot of minorities were, "Mm," you know, it's too good to be true. And maybe it was a trap or, or something like that. So I think through these relationships, it, it's, it's helped me tremendously through John. And I see what Lewis is doing uh, because you, you have somebody you can trust. So it's all, it's on different levels uh, with where the policies are getting changed and also doing our part as minorities, educating ourselves and, and, and working with people who, who are in direct communication with the, the governor's office and with the uh, NJEDA and, and people as yourself in the, in the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, so that that's where it goes. It's 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 policy change and, and the connection, the relationships between those groups and, and the Federal Reserve Bank and, and um, you know, just educating ourselves and, and working to help each other. Thank you, Eric. And yeah, we've I'm gonna I'm, we've got a couple minutes here for for questions. We've got about 10, 15 minutes. I'm gonna start to take some questions from the audience, but continue to put your questions in the QA. I'm also gonna remind everybody as we're having this discussion, as I'm asking my incredible panel here about solutions and thinking about these structural problems, you can also share your thoughts. Uh, again, in the Slido, um, we have some polls and some questions up there. Um, and we encourage you, if you're doing something really interesting, I see some folks are answering here anonymously. If you're doing something really interesting, you want us to reach out to you, you want other people to connect with you, tell us who you are, tell us what your idea is, tell us what you're working on. Um, so I do wanna ask this question that's in the chat here about CDFIs. I know it's something that came up a little bit in our conversations. Um, you know, Where do we see that our CDFIs coming into play? What more need is there? I- I'm gonna ask you this question, Luis, because I know you and I have reflected on this a little in your listening sessions and John, feel free to jump in. Um, but particularly as we think about the role CDFIs have historically played in a lot of states to get to the smallest businesses, what does it mean for CDFIs to really be doing equity-related work? Yes, I mean, CDFIs are community development financial institutions. I recovered for one that I spent like seven years. Um, we used to be a, a micro uh, lending, uh, the largest in the state for a couple of years. And CDFIs was offered to participate a, 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 on the PPP program. And also the NJEDA provide them a loss reserve fund to support them in case that they provide loans to, to any small business owner. And due to the pandemic, those loans fail, right? And I believe that a few years ago, and I don't want to, I, I believe, let's say five years ago, I attend a uh, uh, AEO conference or Opportunity Fund conference in Philly when they were celebrating 25 years of the CDFIs movement. And you know, through the conference, I realized that we have been 25 years identifying the problem or making that diagnosis of the problem, but we didn't be able to provide a, a, an answer. CDFIs supposed to fulfill the need between uh, in a startup and a bank. When the bank is not willing to consider an entrepreneur, 
the CDFI as a, as a non-for-profit, they will um, fulfill that need and that gap, and that's the best alternative that we have. Unfortunately, the cost of the capital or the access to capital for the CDFIs is very high or is very difficult because the majority of them, they just do fundraising in order for them to access to capital, in order for them to provide the capital to, to small businesses. I think that something needs to change on the equation in a way that they will be able to access to more capital in order for them to scale. I will tell them that they need to reach out to, to the NGEDA and learn from the NGEDA how the NGEDA, NGEDA was able to scale from 500 to 70,000 because technology is the answer. If the CDFIs use technology, they won't depend on more individuals to scale. And I think that if they are able to scale using technology and if they can get funds and support to, to uh, pay for that technology, they also will need to access to capital in order for them to be able to help to answer this problem or to solve this problem, the access to capital. I will say that um, it's important for us that we develop the relationship with someone who can uh, make a decision. Many of our minority small business owners, they develop the relationship with the customer service person or the, the teller at the branch. Those individuals are good, but they won't be able to make a difference for your business. The best way to finance your business is through your customers. Many of the individuals that came asking for help they didn't make enough money in order for us to help them. But those who have all the, the reports, the accounting reports, the financial statements ready, we was able to help them. And unfortunately, in our communities, sometimes we need crisis to educate our members <laughs> or to educate our, our community individuals. Because a lot of people that there was no uh, reporting everything, they used to have people in 1099 instead of W2 form, when the PPP came out, they realized what was the difference because the PPP was to protect employment because no everybody was able to go to the unemployment office. And for that reason, the federal government decided, let's keep people working through their regular jobs, right? Now, I just wanna tell you that I was part of the process. We was not able to finish the document when the money, the, the first draw was like, use, took us another uh, round of funding in order for us to figure it out and we improve. But I believe that the government at state level and the federal level, they do have the, the capacity to enforce that the laws, like the one that John described, that 30% of everything uh, that is contracted by the state supposed to be addressed to minorities. 4% of the entire budget of the state of New Jersey need to be addressed to veterans. And I'm very grateful for them. And if there's any veterans in the audience, thank you for your service. But I believe that the, the, the dollar amount that have been uh, addressed through contracts, through the state government is minimum. And we need to improve that because the lowest exists. We just need to enforce in a way that we can get what we was expecting when we put those laws in, 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 in place. Excellent, thank you, Luis. We've got one other question here that I really also wanna ask and other folks who wanna reflect on CDFIs, we've got about five minutes left, but there's a really great question here in the chat that I, I wanna lift up and I feel like maybe John or Eric you touched on this a bit. Um, what is collectively being done to address systemic and structural issues such as archaic underwriting processes? So you may have some people who are listening today who are underwriters and what they're talking about here is this requirements of net worth statements, right? In places where we know about the wealth gap and, and communities of color. Um, and so, um, yeah, they, they mentioned your comment, Mr. Harmon, about, you know, the reality of many small minority owned businesses in terms of wealth gap, collateral requirements. Um, and so curious from what you have heard or what you have seen, what are some best practices or solutions around uh, these issues around underwriting? No, I think it's a great question, um, but, you know, notwithstanding all the past history and the current headwinds, I, I think we're, in, a, we're in, a, in, a, in an encouraging place in New Jersey right now. 
And, and I can't underscore that. Um, when we talk, you hear over and over about the EDA, you hear about Governor Murphy. Murphy. I, I think they're hearing us now in New Jersey. And it's evident by, you know, um, Louise talked about the number of, of loans, that the applications that the EDA did. Specifically, what they did, they listened and then they pivoted. Um, so New Jersey has some policies, but for instance, they use opportunity zones as a way of getting right down into the heart of the community. If they would, the traditional approach, they would have had a minimum level of participation. So they were very creative and responsive. And so that's what I mean by being encouraging. In addition, three years ago, we, we emphasized the importance of bonding. Um, to date, we've done about 33 million in bonds. And, and for people looking to do public contracts in New Jersey, over 200,000, you have to have a bond. So they're hearing, they're responding. Technical assistance and outreach. And you know, in the last few months, it's been a seismic shift in, in terms of engagement and so on and so forth. But to the heart of your question, we're having discussions now with our CDFI partner, New Jersey Community Capital, about being a little more creative with the uh, documenting people's ability to pay instead of your traditional um, um, information mm -hmm. on um, credit. You know, we have to be creative. Um, when I was in banking years ago, we created a, a home buyers program where we were using utility bills and rent receipts as a way of developing credit. So I just think that when you're underwriting a loan or a deal, you have to listen to the applicant. Uh, if you have a good business model, you have to get at the heart of how they have been able to do business, how they've been able to access credit and bring some of those practices in, in, in alignment with structuring their credit worthiness. I, I just think as we continue to build these relationships, we have to be open to ways of getting more people in the economy and access to credit is one, but traditional, we have come to find out that we don't just watch TV on TV now, we're using devices. So same thing about lending. We, we just can't rely on traditional statements or traditional means. We have to go outside of the box and try to get the business done. If a person has a good business model, good banking relationship, we should be able to figure this out. Excellent. Thank you, John. And so we've got about three minutes. I'm going to ask for just a closing comments here. Uh, for, I'll start with Erica and, and Lillian. Um, since we haven't heard from you all on these issues, what would you want folks to take away from this conversation in terms of the businesses you serve, the businesses you represent, um, and, and why this is such a, a critical conversation right now? Thank you, Ashley, for this opportunity. I thought uh, I, I think this is a way to start to uh, making big changes and making a big impact into our community that that we represent. But on, on also, I wanted to mention that this is not this is we are trying to open the doors and expand the opportunities. But for people who really are prepared for to take it to the next level, this is not going to work for individuals who really are not ready or who really wanted to have everything easy. I think for individuals or for businesses, uh, responsible businesses like such a ILDA that is having a big impact and is, is doing everything right, but the opportunities are not there for her. I think those are the kind of businesses or small businesses that we're looking for for to help, uh, you know, businesses who really going to be responsible and ready to move to the, to the next level. And we are um, here to, uh, to fight for them, to open the door for them, because we are asking, we are asking all these uh, big organizations, change your policy, adopt new models to help them, because these issues are, are coming from a long time. And that, as I mentioned, this is the time. Absolutely. Eric and Helda, as the small business owners here representing so many people who can't be here and so many people whose voices are often not heard in government policies or programs or by financial institutions, what would you share with all of us as we're, as we're closing this panel today? Um, well, 
uh, as uh, everybody here know, I'm undocumented. So uh, the only thing I will say is like, uh, just see around you. Like we are here. We are being an asset to, this, uh, to New Jersey and to the economy of the United States. Uh, we are here and we're here to stay. We're not going anywhere because our countries the, uh, over there, there are nothing that they can offer to us. Like I mentioned before, if I get a loan, I'm gonna use it to grow my business. I'm not gonna use to take it with me back to my country because I'm not gonna be able to do anything over there. They don't offer anything for a business over there. I'm from Ecuador. My Ecuador is a mess right now. So, and I, besides that, I have kids here in the United States. So uh, just look around you. Let's do this case by case. Help us so we can help you. Because by you helping me to grow, I'm gonna be able to collect more taxes. I'm gonna be able to employ more people and I'm gonna be able to expand, which I'm doing right now. Basically, I mentioned that to Luis. You know, I got grants. I got grants, not just for the, you know, for some organizations, but I, I look for my way. I took classes, you know, I apply for, I don't know, this organization is 200. Uh, I took classes over there. They gave us a grant. I mean, I'm not gonna be looking for ways to grow. I'm not gonna stop right here because I wanted to be able to be a model for my community. I wanted to be able to create more jobs. I wanted to be able to leave a legacy for my kids. But I, if, I mean, I need your help. Let's Absolutely. do case by case. Thank you. And Eric, what are your, your closing comments as a reflection as a, as a small business owner here? Yeah, uh, thanks, Ashley. Uh, my closing comments are just to continue with these uh, relationships. Um, relationships make the world go around. Uh, to, I spoke to a couple of other entrepreneurs before I got on this call and, and asked them what they would want to say. And um, the, the main thing was just changing, changing the perspective of just when they walk into a room uh, with a bank. Um, so I, I think that's done through education and policy changes. So uh, I'm I'm bright. I'm looking forward to a bright future. This opportunity, uh, with all bad things that come into our lives, you know, there's the equal and opposite good. So I think we have this opportunity to take care of uh, some systemic issues and and correct them with uh, with the help of the Federal Reserve Bank and and others like uh, Tim and and John and Lewis, uh, but. I would just say, keep your head up as a, if I was speaking to the others on the call as entrepreneurs, uh, continue to, to, to make, reach out to, to Lewis and, and Lillian and John and, and other entrepreneurs that may have connections with uh, groups like this to, to educate yourself and, and uh, come into the room and make, be a part of this great country and, and help, help not only uh, help your business, but, but help this country uh, change and become what they should be. Excellent. Well, thank you, Eric, Hilda, Luis, Lily, and John. This has been such a fantastic conversation. I feel like we could keep talking for like two more hours. Um, so I encourage you all to reach out to the folks who are here on the panel if you're interested in their work. And we're just so grateful for your partnership and, and the conversation we've had here today. And I think hopefully the start of some great work we can do collaboratively. Um, and I do want to mention here as we're, we're talking, we do want to hear from other small business owners in the room. So a reminder, um, we're going to plug this one more time at the end, but if you haven't done the small business credit survey, um, we're going to put that there in the link. And I'm really excited to welcome back Tim from NJEDA just to share uh, your reflections um, on this conversation that we've had today uh, and how NJEDA is really thinking about this work in close. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. And uh, it, it's great to be back uh, speaking uh, from earlier this morning. Uh, let me just take a moment to thank the, the panelists as well. Uh, uh, John and Luis, who I know super well in both cases, who are great partners, and, and Lillian and Hilda and Eric, thank you for for your contributions as well. Um, you know, the, I think as a number of people were just saying in the, in the last few minutes, and I think Eric just said it really well. Sort of the relationships and the networking and the the connectivity that conversations like this can help foster, but they really need to keep keep going after um, uh, sessions like this is incredibly important. So, uh, hopefully, this is a, a I don't, my my guess is we didn't solve the world's problems today in the last two hours, but hopefully we we helped set the the uh, the framework for continuing to make some progress, uh, which is is uh, a decent day's work for a Monday morning. Um, you know, I think 
as we continue our focus at the EDA, you know, under Governor Murphy's leadership, and again, a great partnership with folks like John and Luis and, and Carlos Medina and Jeff Cantor and Francisco Cortez at the uh, at the Veterans Chamber and lots of other uh, chamber partners uh, all throughout the state. You know, I think we're going to have to continue to come up with new and innovative programs and continue to tweak and pivot. I heard John mentioning some of our sort of our adjustments as we went during COVID and continuing to have that kind of mindset of let's try something, see if it works. If it's not, fix it. If it is working, expand it. Um, Cause there's a lot, you know, there's lots of good, there's lots of good ideas and there's lots of, of ideas that seem good, but then aren't when you sort of start implementing them. And so, um, you know, we're continuing to innovate and it, innovate and iterate with new programs. Our board just last week, you know, Christina Fuentes is on who runs all of our small business efforts uh, under Ty Cooper's uh, leadership on her team, uh, a new micro business or actually expanded uh, micro business uh, loan program, basically a forgivable, a half forgivable or partially forgivable uh, loan that functions a bit like a grant and a bit like a loan, uh, a $20 million program funded from our uh, main street allocation that I mentioned earlier in my opening remarks of the $100 million that we were allocated, uh, about a 20, 20 million will go for uh, this micro business loan program, and again, really designed to help businesses spring into recovery from COVID. Um, as we think about, you know, taking new space, refreshing your, uh, refreshing your, um, your space, making, you know, using it for working capital to, to bring people back um, and, and hire folks as we, as the economy continues to grow, you know, a, a really flexible piece of financing, low cost financing that we think could be a really valuable tool. That's in addition to things like our lease programs. So if you're taking new space, um, uh, essentially a grant program that's available right now, the micro business loan program will, will come online in the very early part of next year and stay tuned. And please do send us ideas to the, uh, as Ashley mentioned, we, you know, we're, we're always eager to get good ideas, um, and good, good input and tweaks and changes to things and how we're doing things. Because again, I think we're, we're, um, we're confident that we can get some, make some progress, but we're pretty humble that we don't have all the answers. Um, we don't have, we don't have nearly many of the answers. So, uh, if we can, if we can hear from folks who are, whether they're people who use the programs or just you know, smart people who have ideas about how we can be changing and tweaking our programs for all years. Um, I'll just conclude by uh, offering another thanks to, to Rich Kasman and our team um, in the policy and economics department uh, within the EDA for their partnership with the Philly Fed. These are the kinds of conversations we want to be in the middle of uh, and, and, may, and having uh, honest, sober, fact-driven, research-based uh, assessments of what's going on in the world, whether where we can do more, where we need to focus, what we need to do better. Uh, and so kudos to, to Rich and his team, again, under Ty Cooper's leadership uh, within her shop uh, to make sure we're you know, partnering in a different kind of way than we might have a couple of years ago um, and might not have had those capabilities. So um, this is, it's an exciting time and appreciate again, Ashley and the team at the Fed for bringing this conversation together today, the team that did the research uh, of our own and your, you and your colleagues uh, that, that did the work on, on this report. It's important to continue to focus on these issues, uh, and continue to make progress on. So with that, I'll bid you a good, I guess we have two minutes left in the morning. I'll say good morning um, and uh, yeah. good, good rest of your day. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tim. And, and really, thank you so much to our colleagues in the JEDA, um, Rich and Ty and Christina, who've just been so great in the work that you're doing, so intentional about centering racial equity and the small businesses that, that are most impacted. Um, and part of that is, again, because of the work we do with the Small Business Credit Survey. So I'm going to share that, li that link again in the chat. Um, but if you are listening today and you are a small business owner or you work with small business owners, the Small Business Credit Survey is a, a system-wide thing. We, we do this across the Federal Reserve System. So we are gathering data that impacts policy and conversations across the country. And I'm happy to share that some of the folks we work with on the Fed system are also today thinking about the work that you're doing here in New Jersey. Um, and so the more you can elevate the voices of small businesses, the more we can really make sure that we're, we're having the impact we need um, in terms of our economic policy. So um, again, thank you so much to everyone who joined. We are going to be posting a recording of this live online. And then we are going to be kind of pivoting now as we've been doing this research and thinking about the problems New Jersey small business owners face into thinking about solutions. So I encourage you to continue to share your ideas and your thoughts. Please reach out to me or any of our other panelists here if you have a thought on some work that can be done to really ensure that we're, we're centering an equitable recovery for small businesses. Uh, so we thank you so much for joining today, for being a part of this conversation. This is such a critical moment in our economy for small businesses, and we know that the fight has really just begun. And we've seen some really tremendous impacts over the past year and the two years that we have been in this pandemic. And we hope that this is a moment where we can come together and say some of these issues we need to address are structural issues 
that we need to be continuing to work on. So we're really pleased to be able to do this work and partner with all of you in New Jersey. And again, uh, thank you so much for coming today and we hope you'll continue to share your ideas. Thank you.